Well, in 2011, the 42 year reign of Muammar Gaddafi as Libya's leader ended on an acrimonious note. The Arab Spring of January of that year had raised a descent from Libyans to their leader. Now, supported by the West, Libyan rebels saw to the end of Gaddafi, but what followed has been a complete opposite of their expectations. Now, mired in violence, failing to live in peaceful coexistence for the better part of decade, Libya has faced its worst days. In a supposed bid to put the country back in the direction of peace, the United Nations is backing an election, which may be the country's first transition into a democracy, albeit without a constitution. The men on the ballot also don't spark excitement. Who are these men? What's Libya doing? Is this the way to the transition it has long desired? On VSA Today, we'll be answering these questions and more. Welcome, I'm Suleiman. Well, Libya has come a long way since the death of Muammar Gaddafi. It has dealt with violence, unrest and the absence of stability. Now, when the elections are seen as a democratic route to gaining power, it leaves more than just electoral exercises for Libyans, but a process that may be the glue the nation needs. It is its first democratic election in history. Now, with no constitution in place, no clear rules in operation, and a feel of Western imperialism, many fear the election may lead to further cracks. The men in contention also leave very little to savor with uh, Khalifa Haftar in pursuit of the presidency. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, the second son of ousted leader Muammar Gaddafi, Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Biba, and Speaker Aguila Saleh. Now, there are many more candidates seeking to lead Libya, but none may be the solution without a proper structure in place. Now, Federica Saini Fasunotti, Associate Senior Fellow at ISPI Milan and non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution USA and Carvin Dark, global affairs analyst, both join me now. Well, lady and gentlemen, many thanks and thanks for joining us. Now, let's quickly start with you, uh, uh, Car Carvin Dark. You know, a whole lot happening from the 2011 Arab Spring and Gaddafi's fall. Libya has faced several challenges. Is it appropriate? that the UN is still trying to set the country in motion. Well, I'm, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, let me take this uh, to Federica. It uh, looks like uh, Calvin can't hear me. Federica, if you're there, uh, let us in on what... Okay, I can see you nodding, so I go back to Calvin. Uh, Calvin, we're trying to look at the Arab Spring in 2011 and, uh, yeah, ultimately the fall of Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, many are asking if it's still very much appropriate that the UN is still trying to, you know, set the country in motion after so many years. Well, I think what is going on is that the UN and the international community have a sense of responsibility to try to bring a little bit of order and, you know, kind of end the chaos that, as you said, is going on a decade. But the, but the reality is, is that there's only so much that the UN can do. Um, there's obviously, it's got to be the Libyan people, the current leaders, and whoever uh, wins the election, if the election takes place, is planned. So I think the UN is playing the role that it has to, but I don't think we should overestimate what role it or the United States or other Western powers can play. Okay, let's welcome Federica here. I, again, thanks for your time. And looking at what's happening in Libya, Federica, people are asking, uh, how bad is the situation in Libya at the moment? Because it's almost impossible for anyone to speak to any Libyan on issues that borders on national development of that country. The situation uh, is very difficult at the moment because uh, 
you have this uh, difference, this huge difference, which is given by the fact that uh, Libyan people, they want to have elections. And uh, of course, we know that uh, more than uh, 2 million and 500,000 um, people now uh, try to, to vote, uh, to be ready for the vote uh, on the 24th. And on the other side, you have a terrible political uh, class which is not ready for election at all. And on side of that, uh, you you have, of course, uh, millions of weapons and uh, uh, militias, which, uh, of course, to have stability after an election is not a good thing. So, Calvin, uh, will it be better if the people, we're talking about Libyans now, if they're left alone to chart a path for, for their own future? Well, I think that in an ideal situation, that would, that would be the aspiration of the people of Libya and um, of powers around the world. However, it's not, it's not clear that the people would have that say or that that say would be respected. You know, one of the things that I've thought a lot about as we look at the candidates, the many candidates, particularly those at the top, um, not many people are really asking the question that if the Libyan people, for example, do make a very clear choice, will the other um, people of power in the country accept it? And I think that also given the involvement of so many um, international powers, you've got France, you have Russia, you've got the United States to some extent, and of course you have the UN, it's everybody's involved. So while I think that the US, for example, wants this decision to be made by the people of Libya, the US also realizes that it's not that simple, that they do need the help and support to make sure that whatever they express is respected. Before I go back to Federica, let me stay with you, Calvin. You used the word, the phrase, in an ideal situation. That would have been it. So what makes it, uh, well, not an ideal situation at the moment? Well, I think that once, what makes it not an ideal situation now, not only do we have the kind of, um, you know, kind of ambiguity uh, that everyone will accept the um, election, but also with the, the process. And there, not only do the citizens of Libya have to be able to vote, but they have to have confidence in the process. Mm. And there have been discrepancies in some of the election laws. Um, and, you know, if you don't play by the rules of the game, even if those rules should be different because they differ in other countries, um, just like to point out, for example, there's been a lot made about the fact that one of the main candidates is staying in office while he's running. And, you know, I believe it was a three-month period or so where he wasn't supposed to be in power and running for an election. That's important because that is the election law there. But for example, here in the United States, we, you can run for office and be in office. So it's not that a particular set of rules is the best, but whatever the set of rules are have to be respected. And if they're not, that decreases the confidence that the citizens who are going to be voting will have in the process and the results. Let me bring in Federica here. Uh, Federica, you know, now we're looking at what happened, you know, since 2011. And uh, does it worry you that this, till this moment, uh, well, getting close to the eve of 2022, uh, there's still, you know, some form of instability in Libya? Well, absolutely. First of all, as I, as I was telling you, there are militias <laughs> and they have. Uh, uh, you know, the control on the ground, uh, they are very flexible, the situation is very fluid at the moment. Um, they can change part in any, in any second, in any moment. So uh, we don't have, you know, the guarantees that uh, if, for example, Aftar should win, would win, um, the other parts uh, in Tripolitania would accept him. And so, Again, we will have protests, and then we will have turmoils, and then we will have, again, a civil war. We don't have to forget that Libya, at this point, uh, uh, has lived uh, three uh, different civil wars. 
in 10 years. So the first one was in 2011, of course, to, uh, to destroy the regime. The second one was after the elections of 2014 uh, that were uh, a failure, a complete failure. And the third one was in April 2019, when uh, Field Marshal Khalif Haftar decided to uh, put on siege uh, the capital Tripoli. So uh, that's the situation at the moment. And uh, as my colleague uh, uh, was telling you rightly, uh, the point is that uh, there is no, a, not a real constitutional law. Uh, there is no constitution. Um, there is no control. Um, it's, you know, at, at the moment we are full of constitutional doubts uh, uh, and uh, uh, the candidates uh, are Khalifa Haftar, uh, who has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, who is guilty of uh, human uh, uh, crimes, uh, Saif al Islam Gaddafi, same thing, uh, Mr. Baiba, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, the Government of National Unity, this kind of transitional government for which the Baiba should have lived. Uh, uh, you know, should have not participated to the electoral race, and it's, in, instead he did it. So uh, the situation is absolutely bad in, in this moment. And by the way, frankly, I think that the elections will will be, you know, at this point a chimera, very difficult to be oh. held at that at that point. Okay, Patrick, I'll come back to you so that you tell us more about the election. What do you think about the election? Carvin, you know, listening to Federica, some of the key things that should worry anyone, uh, you know, close watchers uh, like yourself who, who's following trends uh, in global politics is uh, what we're seeing today in Libya. W w is it best for a country to go, like Libya, to go into an election with no constitution, uh, knowing full well that even love him or hate him while he was there for over 40 years uh, they still had a, a constitution uh, talking about Muammar Gaddafi uh, is the world to uh, is the world in such a hurry uh, to bring about a, a democratic government in Libya to the extent that uh, that all important aspect of any country's national life uh, is being overlooked Well, I think what we have to keep in mind is that there are, very, there are very valid arguments for what you just said about having a constitution in place, um, making it more secure for the vote, making sure that more people are able to vote. But what usually ends up happening is that can get kicked down the road. Um, we know that there are many countries around the world that, you know, under the name of reforming the constitution or emergency, States of, states of existence that were supposed to last for weeks, lasted for years, some for decades. So I do think we have to have a balance because we don't want this to go on forever. But then also, we don't want an election that ends up making things worse. And what we also have to think about is what are the aspirations of the Libyan people? Because it's easy for me uh, here in the United States to sit here and say, well, you know, democracy is important, but we'll let you know when we're ready. So that you've got to balance the issues of security for the region, the people who are voting, and also their aspirations, because they deserve to live in a, in a place where they have a say in their government just as much as I do. Now, the tricky part comes in is to who decides that timeline. And, you know, as much as I love the international community and the UN, time isn't their um, best skill. So I think we have to balance that because democracy is needed, but it has to be it has to be born in a place with structure. So, so um, uh, Federica, uh, we'll come back to you now, and uh, we're looking at this election uh, that uh, the entire world is, uh, you know, so interested in, and uh, somehow you've been able to mention some of the candidates. And in my opening, I looked at the list and I said, "Wait a minute, these are." Are these the best? That should be a question now to you, Federica. Are these the best of the very best for Libyans, uh, politically speaking, to go for this election? Uh, well, the situation is very complex and articulated because, of course, we now we are analyzing 
these candidates. Um, but they are just uh, the reflection of the fact that uh, Libya has never had uh, a real democracy, has never had a political class, has never had uh, uh, political parties. Uh, and so uh, Libyan citizens are absolutely not ready in this way, even though, of course, they want uh, a, a democracy, uh, a stable state, um, a wealthy state, uh, but they haven't the structure, as Calvin uh, uh, were telling us. So there is no structure, there is no uh, leadership. Um, they have been not educated for that. I mean, Gaddafi did many, many things, uh, uh, in some respect, even something, a few things good, like uh, alphabetizing uh, the whole population. But the level, you know, of uh, the, the the leaders of uh, of Libya is still very low, uh, the cultural level and so on. So in this situation, we can see that in the fact that there is not important in the end for them the the good of the nation and of the Libyan people, but they are much more interested in their own interests, and that's absolutely clear. Calvin, let's look at uh, the, the candidates uh, just a, a bit before we start, you know, talking about each. But if you look at the list of the, of the top candidates for this election, is it safe for us to say that these candidates are a reflection of the deep tribal and cultural divide in Libya? Yes. Um, and one of the things that I find interesting, especially with Gaddafi, is not only does he represent um, a definite uh, group, um, I believe in the South, but he also represents the past. He also reminds people about the time of his father that while he was a dictator, there was stability, as, as weird as that sounds. But then you've also got um, with uh, uh, Haftar, You've got those who support him, and then you have those on uh, on the West. So mm -hmm. they do represent the different factions, but I don't know if it, it'll depend on which vision for the future that they um, portray for the country. And one of the things that I found interesting as I was looking on social media is you have um, a significant number of Libyans, for example, who are reminded about the stability that they had pre-2011. And so that may work in, in Qaddafi's favor. But as you said, that there are strong divisions um, on all sides for these top three candidates um, that, and, and, and the other ones, but these top three that the Libyan people have to choose from. Now, Federica, you, 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 you were a little bit uh, skeptical about how this election will go, uh, you know, come eve of Christmas, uh, 24, you know. But, Let's talk more about uh, the key things uh, I just asked Carvin, and it has to do with the deep cultural and tribal divide, you know, in Libya. And if you go through the list, uh, Saif al-Islam, Khalifa Haftar, uh, Biba, and of course uh, Saleh, it, it, it tells you where the country is headed. Do you think uh, this election will ultimately solve some of the key, you know, divisions uh, and acrimonies uh, in Libya, uh, at the end of the day, I see you nod your head in, in the negative. No, absolutely, absolutely not. It's impossible. Uh, the elections can be really a dangerous boomerang uh, when you don't have stability, when you, when you don't have the structures to permit to have elections. So uh, it's not a joke here. And um, the situation is very, is very difficult and very fluid at the moment. Um, and I think that elections will be postponed. Very, very, it's very probable at this point. Uh, although the Electoral Commission uh, gave the list of the candidates for the presidential, we have to say that this is the, 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 the first round of presidential elections which is important because uh, um, at the beginning they should have been 
together, presidentials and parliamentary elections. Uh, then there were many divisions and many discussions about that, and so uh, it appeared a few weeks uh, ago that it would have been just presidential elections with during the second turn uh, also parliamentary elections and that in my opinion was a mistake because of course uh, with uh, 98 uh, uh, candidates for uh, the presidential uh, seat you can imagine uh, in all those divisions that we talk about uh, until now you can imagine that the situation will be explosive mm. and so i think that at, at this point elections uh, uh, will be probably may be postponed. Uh, uh, Calvin, uh, what's your take on that? Uh, you, you go with Federica? Yes, I, um, I'm never a fan of the kind of staggered elections. And so even, even with all the other dynamics, um, especially when it's so problematic in some areas to vote, I was, I, I'm just never a fan of that. So I definitely agree on, on that end. What I will say is interesting when it comes to, you know, whether the elections will be postponed and everything like that. I was following what the U.S. State Department was saying and um, the embassy uh, in Libya, was, they were putting out some information and I was trying to get the message in it. And their message seemed to be, there's no reason why this shouldn't go forward. We support a process. Let's get this over with, which, like I said, doesn't reflect the realities that my colleague outlined that I totally agree with. But it does show that there are some world powers, United States being one of them, that believe now, now is better than kicking it down the road forever. Um, but is the country ready? That, that's an open question. Calvin, have you, in your, in your you know, following of developments in Libya, uh, what do you get you know, from the people? Do you think the people are enthusiastic about this coming election? Well, I think that they are enthusiastic about stability. Um, I want to say democracy. Of course, how, what that democracy looks like depends a lot on the, the uh, uh, formal constitution and laws. Um, but I do think that there, there is worry that the, because, you know, you, elections don't necessarily lead to democracy, although they can is what we say here in the United States. So I think there is enthusiasm that stability and to move forward tempered with apprehension of whether the elections should go forward as they are with the candidates, with, with the non-framework, um, and then with the timing. Federica, you know, uh, looking at you uh, and Calvin, it looks an easy task talking about Libya. Uh, it might interest you, I'm just saying so that you know, that an average Libyan is afraid to speak to the press. An average Libyan would want to say anything, even if he or she lives outside of Libya. He or she tells you, I have families in Libya, I don't want to say anything good or bad about Libya. What do you think they are afraid of? Because once upon a time, the world thought they were afraid of Muammar Gaddafi. And it's over a decade and people are still afraid to speak. Well, it depends uh, if we talk about Tripolitania or if we talk about Fezzan or Cyrenaica. I mean, if you are in Cyrenaica where you have uh, a real uh, kind of regime in many respects with uh, the control of uh, the terrain from Khalifa Haftar and he is uh, army, let's call it, it's a, in, in the end, it's, it's just a cluster of militias, so it's not an army at all, but they they like to call it uh, the Lish, Libyan National Army. Mm -hmm. um, the control of the military there is much more uh, strict in many, in many respects. Um, of course, if you go in, in other place, uh, uh, like in Tripolitania, it depends where you are, in which city you are. Uh, there is a, f a control, of course, or even in those places uh, from um, militia, armed men, uh, and so on. Uh, but it's different. So it depends when uh, and where you are. Uh, 
and in which context. But still, um, when you think that the numbers uh, of weapons in Libya, and I'm talking about a report made by the United Nations in 2017, uh, weapons light and heavy were valued something like 20 million mm. uh, on a population of 6 million people. So uh, how can you take and held elections uh, if you have so many weapons uh, all uh, you know over the country is absolutely is absolutely nonsense in my opinion very dangerous. Well Kevin uh, quickly here you know uh, there's you know, there are possibilities that uh, either party will reject this election. <laughs> uh, because if you look at the temperament of these uh, candidates, uh, so do the current conditions uh, truly and honestly, uh, you know, weighing in on what is happening in Libya, uh, conditions call for an urgent need for a postponement of the election? Uh, I know you said you're, you're not a fan of, you know, such, but. Uh, Speaking objectively, uh, does it call for a postponement? Well, I think a postponement, I, I could be persuaded for a postponement if the postponement comes with a plan. But if it's too open-ended and too indefinite, and if it's not clear who will shepherd and lead this process that, uh, that's credible, then I don't think a postponement without a plan will just um, cause more chaos. And, uh, you know, the, the, the return of uh, Saif al-Islam, uh, Gaddafi, you know, he, he was there, he was taken off, and he came back on the ballot. Uh, and, you know, there are Libyans who feel uh, that his father was harshly treated. And uh, do you think it's right that he's allowed to contest despite his current human rights abuse charges? Well, I think that, that that is definitely valid, and I know that if he were to win, that's going to be an issue for the United States international community. But, you know, what about the general, um, Haftar? Like, you know, he's got his own baggage and issues there. So um, I definitely see the argument for not having Gaddafi in the race, but it's not as if some of the other candidates don't have problems of their own that would not inspire confidence in some of the Libyan people. Federica, uh, quickly, uh, do, do you think that uh, some, someone, if not uh, everyone, uh, is running, you know, from justice here, yeah, looking at uh, Saif al-Islam and uh, his current human rights uh, charge, uh, I mean, uh, charges of uh, case on him, and uh, looking at the other candidates? Uh, what readily comes to mind, uh, is anyone trying to buy some form of local state immunity? Well, uh, probably yes. Uh, but on the other side, I think that they are not so much interested uh, at this point because some of them, they have the or they own uh, uh, army. Uh, some of them are absolutely not interested in the, in the international law and so on. Um, and probably they, they, they think that the international community is not so much interested uh, in, uh, in this kind of crimes. And the important thing is, in the end, to, to have, uh, you know, the, the presidential seat and to start uh, governing uh, the country. In which way, this is the big question. Um, because still Libya is a country very distant, unfortunately, from uh, a regular uh, terrain to have elections, to have a, a healthy state, and uh, to have functioning institutions. Still, we, we have to remember that uh, Libya is divided in many of its central and fundamental uh, institutions. So a part uh, of the institution, for example, the Central B Bank uh, of Libya is uh, in Tripoli and the other side uh, and the other part uh, is uh, in Tobruk uh, so, uh, or in Derna or in Benghazi. So um, still, uh, the country, in my opinion, is far away from uh, the chance and the possibility to have elections and stability. Uh, the problem is that the international community has thought that uh, election were the answer 
Uh, but the point is that Libya is not a common country, it's not a nation with institutions, with the fundamental infrastructures and political infrastructures that can permit elections to be held. Otherwise, it will be a disaster, as it was, for example, in uh, the elections of 2014. All you watching VSA here on New Central Television coming up, who will look at the enormous fault lines and uh, the candidates leading in this Libya of December 24th election. Stay with us. Enormous fault lines uh, threatening Libya's uh, unity and seeking peace uh, through the polls uh, is uh, a Western adoption by the analysis of most Libyans. Now, there are also mixed opinions about Libya's readiness to conduct an election. The political, social, and legal conditions in the country may not support a peaceful transition. Now, free and fair elections may also be a difficulty considering the current state of events. However, some Libyans are upbeat about the chances of the country from here. Still have with me Federica and Calvin. Thank you for your time. Now, let's start with you, uh, uh, Calvin. Haftar, according to reports, has the backing of mercenaries from Sudan, Chad, uh, Russia, and others. Now, do you think uh, a defeat will be taken in good faith? Sorry, can you repeat that last part? Do you think a, a defeat will be taken in good faith? No, and that's going to be the difficult part um, for several of the candidates, but for the reason that you mentioned, who would be there to enforce the rule of law in a country where there isn't that legal and um, constitutional framework? And we also know, when you mentioned, for example, some of the mercenaries, that's one of the things that I know is on the U.S. agenda, because obviously Russia and the U.S. have their own um, geopolitical struggles. And um, too often, um, in places like Libya, these become proxy battles between, um, say, for example, Russia and the United States. And we also know that with different candidates having different backings, will they help those candidates not respect whatever the result is. So that's a very real question that not only threatens the democracy that could take place in Libya, but directly threatens the security of the voters, which is going to influence turnout. Well, Federica, we're still looking at the candidates and looking at their backers or supporters. How can a, a potential war be averted in Libya? We, we have already seen uh, this kind of problems, uh, for example, uh, during the, the, the siege uh, of Tripoli uh, in the spring and, and summer of, 20, of 2019, and uh, where you had on, on some part, like uh, Aftar, uh, 
putting the siege uh, on the capital, uh, supported by the Wagner Group, uh, which is a, a, Rus a Russian contractor in many respects, also if different from many others. Um, and uh, then we had, uh, from for one part and the other, uh, the Tripoli part, uh, Sudanese and Chadian uh, mercenaries, and uh, at a certain point, uh, we had also uh, mercenaries from Syria called by Turkey supporting uh, the, the government of uh, named GNA in those times, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. So um, we have already seen uh, a very particular kind of war in Libya, which is a, an hybrid one. Uh, very different, made with drones, uh, made uh, with uh, light weapons, uh, and a lot of mercenaries. And they have made a difference in many respects. So we are waiting uh, this kind of, uh, of landscape. Well, uh, the, Federica, this is truly and indeed worrisome, uh, knowing full well that uh, other parts of the continent, Africa, that is, uh, still dealing with, uh, you know, the breakup of uh, Libya, small and light weapons infiltrating so many other parts, even as far as in Nigeria with the Boko Haram group. Now, now I still want to stay with you before I go to Calvin because this is really, really, uh, you know, disturbing. Uh, what more can 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 the world uh, do to help Libyans and Libya, uh, you know, avert this, uh, you know, impending more or less implosion? Well, um, I think that. The, oh, sorry. Uh, if, uh, I'll come to you, Calvin. Uh, I wanted Federica to, to, to start off on this. I will come back to you, Calvin. Apologies. Well, let's say that um, a, a fundamental problem is uh, the monopoly of the force. Uh, in Libya, there is uh, a complete, uh, you know, disgregation, complete. Uh, uh, division of the, this kind of power. So uh, it's full of little militias, bigger or, or little, it depends uh, where we are, um, who detain this monopoly of the force. So we, we don't have a nation, a state institution that can do in, in nationwide uh, this kind uh, of control. And so you, you Plus, you don't have the control of the borders, which is a, an extremely important point. Um, and uh, we know that there is an embargo in Libya for uh, against weapons since uh, 2011, but no one respected that. So the, the country is, is, is full of uh, weapons and uh, everyone uh, does what he wants. Uh, so uh, it's like, you know, in the far west. So, Calvin, uh, I think I can uh, allow you weigh on this, but again, keep in mind uh, some of the key worries uh, of uh, an average African, and th they still think that an outbreak of war in Libya means more trouble for almost every country, you know, around the continent. Yes, and you know, what I believe that the international community should do, and starting with the United States on this issue of security is, one, to recognize that, whether it be in Libya or other places on the continent, that these situations, sometimes these crises, this chaos, doesn't exist in a vacuum. And too often we see American foreign policy, um, foreign policy objectives from the international community that treat these individual situations as if they didn't influence each other. And I think that one way that the U.S. and the international community could do a better job in protecting not only what protecting the citizens of Libya and U.S. interest in Libya and other places around the continent is to establish stronger partnerships with regional neighbors. For example, with Morocco, um, because Morocco has its own um, reasons for wanting to make sure that the region is secure for its own people and to protect its own borders. And there are other allies across the African continent that if the U.S. worked more closely with them and recognized that what any instability, for example, that occurs in Libya will influence other places around the continent, 
then I think we'll have a better handle on it. But if we treat each one as completely separated and not connected to each other, and we don't rely on partnerships with allies who are stable, then we're going to be playing whack-a-mole every time something happens, whether it be in Libya or another hot spot on the African continent. Does it worry you, Carvin, that uh, uh, the United Nations doesn't seem to have a firm grip of situations in Libya? Even the African Union is almost silent or best as asleep uh, on situation in Libya. Yes, they're the pre with the AU and with the UN. Obviously, their actions and statements, or lack thereof. I know it doesn't inspire confidence in me, um, and it definitely, I don't believe, would to the Libyan people. But also, um, unfortunately, it's to be expected, because we know that within those groups, um, take, for example, with the AU, there's not a consensus among AU members about what is the right path forward in Libya. And the UN is not immune from that either. We've got se severe disagreements at the UN, and we have countries like the United States and Russia, for example, on polar ends of what they think the solution would be on the Security Council. So I think that um, we should measure our expectations with what the UN and the AU could do, especially when it comes to enforcement or any kind of proactive action to protect the uh, living people or to provide a safe environment for elections. Now, Federica, is it, is it compulsory that a constitution should be in place before this election? Because listening to both of you, it just might be uh, uh, a demand that may also, you know, buy time for, for the country and the people uh, to see how they can actually avert any possible, you know, trouble. Well, the, constitu the Constitution uh, is, of course, to have uh, elections uh, very important because the Constitution uh, gives you the framework uh, where you can uh, have those. So uh, that was fundamental. But um, And in fact, there are many uh, Libyan politicians, uh, like it or not, uh, who are absolutely supporters of the idea of a of having a constitution and before of that of having a referendum a constitutional referendum um, but the problem is that uh, even if we had this kind of referendum uh, the country is still in my opinion not ready for it so i think that uh, it, it is reason reasonable to think that we will have probably elections in libya but uh, not very soon, uh, at, at least a stable uh, election, they are able to, to take with them stability and not uh, a even more, an even worse situation. That's, that's my point. So a constitution is, uh, is uh, fundamental, but in this moment, I think that there are many other uh, emergencies more important than constitution. Hmm. So, um, uh, you know, just barely four days to that election and uh, the campaigns haven't started, uh, it's strange. So, uh, yet people know these candidates, uh, some are even afraid to speak about where, uh, you know, they stand. Are there high possibilities that we would see, you know, you know some form of uh, low turnout of voters if, 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 if the election holds? Uh, I, I, I didn't hear uh, the uh, question. Uh, the, the question is, do you think we would likely see a lot of Libyans, you know, come out to vote uh, if the election go, 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 goes ahead? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. If, if, uh, if, of course, the election will be held, we have already uh, more than, you know, almost 3 million uh, electoral uh, papers. So, yes, Libyans want to go uh, to vote. But the point is that uh, it's the framework which is not secure uh, because uh, no one gives, uh, you know, the security for the people if uh, one part will win, one presidential candidate will win uh, 
uh, and, and the other side uh, will not accept it. Mm. So what will happen? And that's the point. Libyans, for sure, they want, uh, they want elections and they want to have a stable country. And that's absolutely right. The point is that their political class is not ready and mature for that. Carvin, the United States and the rest of the world are back in this election despite the challenges we've been discussing here on the show. Do you think that there's a fallback option, option in case violence erupts from that election? Well, um, I think that I think that there's there are several options, um, uh, and I've been really interested to see, for example. There have been several think tanks here in the United States that have proposed different ways of doing this, kind of a backup option, a fourth option. However, when it comes to the U.S., one thing I just want to point out that um, the U.S., I think, is really in a uh, don't, don't break it, don't buy it mode, meaning that I think the U.S.'s only real um, response is going to be to go ahead with the election, even if it's not ready, because if the U.S were to say to postpone it, or were to in any way interfere into it, then they own whatever comes after it. But from a purely political standpoint, not even thinking about the security concerns, if the United States, for example, is pushing elections, and if, say, they get postponed, no one's ever going to blame the US for pushing for elections to increase democracy. So I think that's the calculus that the United, that the United States is making. But I do think that there are people with very valid plans of how we can make this more secure and have a framework with a postponement, with a plan, but it remains to be seen if that's going to take place. All right, Federica, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying for us to talk about uh, uh, the most controversial candidate in this election, and that's Saif al Islam uh, Gaddafi. Uh, how much of a credible candidate is this gentleman? But, well, it's not credible at all, of course. Uh, I think that mm, the majority of Libyans cannot um, forget uh, his participation uh, during the revolution uh, next to his father. Uh, and, uh, of course, his participation to the regime, uh, although, uh, you know, he was just the son of Gaddafi. So I think that it's, uh, this is a, a wound that it's very difficult to forget for Libyans. I've talked with many um, Libyans friends uh, and also few uh, Libyans colleagues. And of course, uh, everyone thinks uh, the same, uh, in the same way. I mean, uh, Saif al-Islam is, is impossible uh, to have him uh, as, a as a president of Libya. Uh, and Calvin, do you, do you see Libyans at some point in time, you know, rising against foreign interventions? We, we've seen that in some other countries, rising against foreign interventions, especially as they approach uh, this all-important uh, historic moment uh, of the national life. Yes, and I think that there's already a sentiment of wanting to decrease or, you know, end um, outside involvement, particularly from the West, particularly from the United States, and that's natural. And I believe from the U.S. point of view, it's what the U.S. wants, because um, I don't think that the U.S. wants to focus its energy on um, meddling too closely in what's happening in Libya. And one thing I just want to say on that, related to that point, as you were talking about Qaddafi's son, one of the other things that I think is going to be a calculus by some in Libya is let's say you know they're considering voting um, for Gaddafi. If they want to regain a footing in the international community, he's going to be problematic. It's going to be problematic having a state visit to the U.S., which I don't think would happen with uh, Gaddafi. Now, granted, um, there are other candidates in the race that might have those same issues. So I think when it comes to international involvement, interference, and international reputation of Libya in the future, that Qaddafi has a lot of baggage that I think the voters are going to have to really think about when they cast their vote. So, Federica, help us here. Um, how would you rate the conduct of the United Nations and the AU so far, you know, towards a development in Libya? 
Well, um, I, I, I do not agree with them in many respects. Uh, as you know, as, as Calvin was telling before, uh, the, there are many divisions, many different points of view uh, in Europe when we talk about Libya, when we talk about migration uh, uh, and so on. And so it's very difficult to have a common idea uh, in, 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 you know, a common program in dealing uh, with the country. Uh, this is the first point. Secondly, uh, the United Nations, because in many respects it's easier, in, in my opinion, um, has uh, focused its attention just uh, on elections because elections are apparently easier to organize. Uh, and uh, in this way, if they work, we can say, okay, now the country is pacified and the country is stable um, and uh, we have done our job. Unfortunately, when we talk uh, about uh, Libya, a country which does not have uh, uh, in, in infrastructures, political infrastructures, as, as uh, we, we said before, um, everything changes, in my opinion. And so elections are just uh, the last point, the apotheosis of uh, uh, a long, difficult uh, political process, political growth. They are not the beginning, and so that's, in my opinion, the the the, the, the you know the mistake here. Uh, and any about the AU, the African Union? Well, uh, the African Union is missing in action. <laughs> that's uh, you know quite, they, quite, they... Quite, quite strange. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, also during uh, uh, the, the revolution, if you remember, uh, the African Union was present, yes, but not so much like, for example, uh, EU or United States uh, or, you know, NATO. So the African Union uh, is not very, you know, present in this process. And that's, uh, that's a real pity in, in many respects because they could do much more. And Calvin, let's see how we can wrap up this. Uh, what does Libya need to stay stable at the moment? Sorry, repeat that, repeat your question, I can hear it. Uh, what do you think Libyans or Libya as a country should be doing to bring about the stability that we are all worried about? Well, I think that they should Obviously, I, I agree with my colleague that elections are, you know, they're, they're part of democracy, but they are not the only part, and they, they, are, they have the most trust in them when they're, um, com when they are conducted in a system with rule of law. I think that the people of Libya should really impress upon the current leaders, the current caretakers, if you will, um, about establishing a framework, establishing a structure, um, because it's not going to mean that if they do that, that elections and democracy will flourish without incident. However, the stronger that they make the structure and the framework now, elections or no, um, the stronger the democracy and the eventual outcome will be. And I, but once again, I think that requires the support of the international community because um, the Libyan people can only say so much um, to the, or the people in power will only listen to them so much. And as you mentioned about the kind of reluctance of some Libyans, particularly in Libya, and even those out to speak out against the leaders and the freely express what they want, that's a reminder that democracy, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. It's instilled in culture, and there's still that culture of fear among some people. So I think in that instance, the United, the United States and international community should help the Libyan people in expressing and, and, and pressing their leaders to establish that framework so they can have democracy and eventual election. Well, it's a fine place for us to say many thanks for being such a nice company, Federica and Calvin. I do hope we'll stay on this and talk more about this so that Africans and even uh, political experts, especially in that axis, and the AU will better understand what it, e it does mean to have peace in Libya. Libya at the moment faces a difficult face ahead and the world is watching.
proceedings from North Africa. Now, with its stability, all to fight for the future is right in front of the country. I'm Suleiman. I'll see you again. Bye-bye.